Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and you're very welcome to this evening's lecture on the Dunt Kettle Interchange Upgrade Project. I'm delighted to um, have this major piece of infrastructure uh, being presented tonight. Um, as you may know, we're celebrating our 80th year of the Cork Region Committee, so I think it's a uh, it's uh, uh, nice to be able to showcase a uh, large piece of infrastructure like this, you know, one of the largest in the country um, happening right here on our doorstep. Um, so tonight we have uh, Jim McCarthy, who's a senior resident engineer with uh, Cork County Council, and uh, he's the stakeholder engagement manager for the project. And um, he's going to bring us through the kind of the background um, to, to the project. And then Pat Delane uh, is also senior resident engineer of Cork County Council. And Pat supervises the actual construction works on the project. And he's going to bring us through uh, the, the current progress on the project. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Jim. Thanks for that, Ronan. Um, yeah, as Ronan said, my name is Jim McCarthy, um, Senior Resident Engineer with Cork County Council, seconded to Jacobs, um, who are the employer's representatives for this project, um, and among my roles is uh, Stakeholder, <coughs> excuse me, Stakeholder Engagement Manager, which gives me the honour of uh, taking part in presentations like this. So I will, uh, tonight, uh, this presentation is titled on Kettle Interchange Upgrade and Overview, and we're going to cover a lot of ground, possibly not in uh, much depth, uh, but there'll be plenty of topics that uh, I'm sure we will return and give presentations on at, at a later date um, that people are interested in. Um, so I'm going to start off by, I suppose, the where, the why, the what are we doing, give a bit of context in terms of what's happening in Cork more generally talk a little bit about communications, and then I'm going to hand over to Pat, who's going to get into the good stuff on the engineering and the, the construction works. Okay, so, um, okay, so where are we? Uh, so done Kettle Interchange, uh, here we are on the meeting of the M8, the N8, N25, and the N40 heading through the Jack Lynch Tunnel in Cork. I've just shown this particular view, just to give it in the context of the, uh, the, of Cork City and Little Island uh, here and, and the Tivoli docks. So that's where we are. Um, that's an aerial view, relatively, um, relatively current aerial view of the area. And just to take a step back in time, just to demonstrate, I suppose, how this area has developed over time. This is a shot from 1995 and the East Cork Parkway, as it was known at the time, is in construction in this image, as you can just see here. Uh, filling in in between the mainland and the island, as it were. Um, and the Dunkettle Interchange is here as we know it back then, but the, the tunnel, I think construction may have just begun on the tunnel at that point. And when we go back further, um, we're not actually on dry land at all. Um, so that just gives a sense of what a heavily engineered area this has been and continues to be. Um, so the scope of the project, I suppose we'd need to start with the Dunkettle Interchange as it was up until very recently. Uh, so as I mentioned there, it is essentially, I suppose, a crossroads of where the M8 to Dublin becomes the N40 Cork Ring Road through the Jack Lynch Tunnel down here, uh, the N8 into the city, which becomes the N25 over the interchange heading for Middleton, Middleton Waterford and, and Ross Lair. Um, uh, of course, the interchange is complicated by uh, a number of local roads uh, which are accommodated within the junction. We've got what's locally known as the Ibis Slip here by what is now Gale Scully Driscoll coming from the Glanmire Glanton Road. We've got the Bury's Bridge Junction, which is a left in, left out junction here. And we've got another left in, left out coming from the R623 Regional Road through Little Island. Um, so they have a major impact on traffic movements through the junction. So the problem that we're here to solve, um, the picture speaks a thousand words and all that. So here is the problem. Here is a typical view um, on the N25 coming in in the morning, uh, looking towards the city, all those queuing, looking to get off the N25 to go through the tunnel. Here's the M8 with Dunkettle somewhere in the distance there. And here's one of the slips merging onto the N40. Um, so to solve the problem, and I should state here, um, interestingly, that uh, uh, Transport Infrastructure Ireland, TII, are both this, uh, the sanctioning authority and the sponsoring a agency for this project, which is, is, is slightly unusual. Um, they are in, in the role of client. Uh, so back in 2010, work commenced on interchange upgrade design. 
uh, 20, in 2012, the motorway order was published and the environmental impact statement uh, was published. 2013, the scheme was approved by Board Planola and notices to treat issued. Um, and as somebody mentioned to me recently, the uh, that time frame from 2010 to 2013, I think we would all um, we'd all bite your hand off if we were offered that on a major road scheme these days. Um, just showing us how things have developed under the whole appraisal and approval and planning process. 2016, technical advisors were procured. Technical advisors were Jacobs, and Jacobs are um, currently in the, the role of employer's representative for TII. On to 2018, uh, advanced works contracts were, were awarded. Uh, so they included site clearance, archaeological resolution, um, and then on through 2018 and 2019, more significant advanced works contracts and de-risking uh, involving uh, major utility work site investigation, active travel facilities, and were, were carried out and Pat will go through those. So in October 2020, the main civils contract was awarded to John Siskin Sun Limited as a design and build contract. And uh, the, the contractual program is for completion of the works on the 29th of March 2024. Okay, so the solution to the problem then, um, so which is here overlaid on the uh, overlaid on the pre-existing um, the pre-existing area, and as um, somebody described it recently as uh, the red cow, the red cow on asset. Um, so it's you could see it's ex extremely complex layout. Um, it will be similar to the red cow on completion in that it will be a free flow junction, heavily signed where the motorists, I guess, will never fully appreciate the complexity of the layout. There will just be a dedicated route for all movements. Um, it's just a, another view of the same of the same thing. And here with the various link names and structure names, just giving a sense of the number of different elements um, that make up the project. Here's a view from the east looking towards the city as it is. and um, and a, a photo montage of as it will be. Similarly, looking from the south from the Jack Lynch Tunnel, looking north towards the M8. Um, and you can see how the new interchange, even though it's, it's very different, it will still be centered on the two N25 flyovers and still making use of those in a, in a, in a slightly different, with different routes. It was just to show samples of some of the routes through the junction on completion. So here's one of the more straightforward uh, coming northbound out of the tunnel on DN40, heading east on DN25. Here we've got coming in from DN25 from the east and heading south through the tunnel. Um, and here we have coming out of the city, uh, looping the loop there to go down through the tunnel and for the south ring, and then coming from the M8. Uh, coming around the dumbbell junction here and heading towards the city. And um, I suppose it's just worth noting in particular the um, the structure, structure one, as we call it, over the N25 here, which is really a fully great separated new junction for Little Island, which takes the place of, um, of the existing left in, left out in this area, which is massively over capacity. So you could say that it's a pair of junctions in a sense, and Little Island has a major impact on the layout of the new junction. Um, because, you know, not only have we got the M8 in 40, N8 and N25, but we've got Little Island and we've got um, access to Glanmire and Glantown to be accommodated as well. There's something like 32 individual traffic movements will be possible through the new junction. Okay, so this was just one element um, of all transport projects that is very much in focus at the moment is accommodating active travel and public transport. And I suppose right from the outset, um, that was uh, something that was included in the Dunkettle Interchange Upgrade Scheme. It certainly could not be said that it is a safe um, route for cyclists or pedestrians at the moment. Um, so as part of the scheme, there's a there are a, a series of cycle routes there, <coughs> excuse me, just color coded on the image here. So it's first of all, just to note that as part of the advanced works, the Dun Kettle roundabout um, over uh, at the end of the Lower Glanmire Road has been, um, has been signalized uh, with crossing points for pedestrians and cyclists incorporated. Um, a cycleway has already been delivered and is open to the public a cycleway and walkway linking the Dunkettle roundabout here to the Glanmire Glantown Road here near Dunkettle House. And um, a, 
and that's an I should say that's an offline cycle array as per the red framed cross section here, um, as part of the works on structure one and link Q as we call it down to the regional road in Little Island, there will be a two way cycleway. Um, offline cycleway incorporated there also. Um, so, and th these are all part, these will be connected to cycleways that Cork County and Cork City are developing on either side. Just to note as well, that I suppose in the area of public transport, that true liaison with the NTA, between the NTA and uh, TII and Cork County Council, a bus lane um, is to be incorporated on this link here, which will contribute to um, providing a sustainable bus route for Little Island. And here's just a shot of the Cork Cycle Network plan, just to give a sense, I suppose, of how this project isn't happening in isolation in terms of the cycle facilities being provided. Duncattle is a critical node in the Cork Cycle Network plan, linking Glanmire and the city to Little Island. Um, and Cork City Council are developing a scheme for a cycleway on the Ballon Glanner Road up to Glanmire. And we're liaising with Cork County Council on their developing scheme uh, out to Carrick Tool and uh, on to Middleton um, and delivering a portion of that as part of the works. Also, I suppose that the Cork Met Metropolitan Area Transport Strategy is a document that um, is very much live now with various projects being delivered, and Dunkettle is a central part of that strategy as well, just showing an extract here in terms of rail access, um, the, the um, CMATS, the transport strategy for Cork, envisages uh, a new train station and a park and ride um, on the existing Irish Rail Freight Depot. So that would be the Dunkettle project would be enabling an in, the in, you know, uh, access to that park and ride by bus, car, uh, pedestrian cycle uh, passengers. Um, just get into a little bit on communication. I suppose communication on the roadside, first of all. I'm, I mentioned advanced works contracts on the Dunkettle itself. I suppose pulling back from the Dunkettle interchange, um, what we was also delivered through 2018, 2019, were a series of um, intel intelligent transport systems equipment consisting of uh, CCTV cameras um, giving coverage of the N40 route uh, to the Motorway Traffic Control Centre in Dublin, where they can um, they can view um, and control those cameras uh, to to monitor traffic and um, intervene intervene when there are any incidents. Um, also a series of variable message signs displaying journey times, which regular commuters will be, be used to. And those journey times are ramping up now, of course, now the traffic volumes are building. Um, and the, those journey times are coming from a series of a ANPR cameras. The Motorway Traffic Control Center have full control of those signs. They can set messages as required. We like this example of the severe wind warning that we had recently. Um, and what I suppose in the context of Dunkettle, what these signs also allow us to do is communicate to motorists about traffic management changes that might be, that might occur up ahead. Um, so we've moved we've moved more we've moved closer to the Dun to the interchange itself more recently through 2021, and this is a sample of one of the portal gantries that have been installed which again will communicate with motorists um, as they approach Dunkettle. So you've got lane control signs and you've got more um, flexible, large scale variable message signs on the left there. And they'll be uh, their full matrix screens, which will be able to display um, text and appropriate pictograms as required. Um, so communication away from the roadside then, I suppose one thing about uh, Dunkettle Interchange, we have uh, numerous critical stakeholders, which Pat, Pat will talk a little bit about in terms of nearby industry, of course, local residents. Um, we've got a large primary school uh, adjacent to the work site as well. But I suppose one thing that's, um, that's unique on this uh, project and challenging more so than a typical linear 
a greenfield roads project is just the sheer number of um, commuters, everyday motorists who pass through the interchange um, because it is such a vital hub and the whole Cork transport network. Um, so we've got a, there's there's a whole different audience there, and we've got a number of tools in place to communicate with those people. So. We've got the project website, our weekly newsletter. We've got our Twitter uh, account at Dunkettle INT, and we've the Dunkettle Live traffic app. So um, the project website with a regular, a weekly updated videos and so on on progress. The newsletter we put a particular effort into um, uh, to sh to update on the progress of works, but more importantly on any upcoming works and roadworks that may impact on commuters. Um, and that goes out weekly on a Friday. Twitter, again, just to, for that more immediate contact, if there are any traffic incidents that we become aware of out there, we can get the word out. Um, and we have good relationships with a number, a number of other stakeholders who just help us get that word out there um, and um, help people avoid any incidents. The Don't Get the Live Traffic app, I suppose we think takes it to another level. So I'll just play this if it will cooperate for me and speak over it. So this is an app that's available on the Play Store and the App Store, which gives live traffic cams um, facing all four directions from the interchange. It gives journey times from the, 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 the all of the major routes through the junction from, from the nearest junction, say, for example, from Junction 18 on the M8 to Kinsale Road on the N40 into Silver Springs out to Junction 2. So it's just at a glance um, in your pocket what traffic conditions are like. And I suppose what, as traffic volumes ramp back up again, um, we had something like up to 120,000 daily using the interchange pre-COVID and we're back to about 90% of that now. And the intention is so that people can have a look at this. And if you don't need to travel, if you can retime your journey based on traffic conditions, it's just to put that in, make that information available to people. Um, we also can give push notifications for those with the app. So you get alerted to any incidents um, as soon as possible. Okay. So in terms of communication, just uh, sort of interest, something that we use on site to communicate um, with stakeholders, uh, given the complexity of the junction, as you've seen, is a, a BIM model that um, that's, that CISC have put um, a lot of work into. Um, and just a close up there, just giving a sense of the level of detail of we'll have a variable message sign here, or lighting columns, or our, our vehicle restraint systems and the bridge columns, you can make out the reinforced soil structures here. And then um, with point cloud survey in the background, which just helps to explain to um, third party stakeholders about planned works. It also allows us to liaise with the Gardaí and so on, on traffic management layouts. And just a sample shot of that there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just about my lot. So, um, in terms of construction design and construction progress, I'm going to hand over to Pat. Um, but initially, uh, I'm going to, while Pat is introducing himself, I'm just going to set up a video, which will hopefully cooperate and play for us. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Patrick Delan. I'm a senior resident engineer. I am played by Cork County Council and second to Jacobs also, similar to Jim, for the looking after the construction of the works on site. Uh, so we have a video here now that will show us uh, how things are going. So this is structure 10 as you come down the M8. Uh, the time point for the works in Link E, that'll be the link from the M8 southbound to the N25 eastbound. So we're maintaining traffic out here in this section. Then as we come down over structure 8, that'll carry traffic in the future, both, both northbound and southbound um, between the N40 and the M8. And so then over the N25 known to our structure five and structure 11. So this video now is going in a northbound direction from the Jack Lynch tunnel. So you can see here at the right hand side structure five, uh, the new link road from the N40 to the N8. 
then uh, link A will take you from the N40 to the N25 uh, eastbound structure 6 which is, which is a widening of the existing structure along with link C which will take you northbound as well then link T1 will be the link from the NA to Little Island again link D and link E as we mentioned already link U uh, the slip road from the NA to the M8 then the cycle way and footpad as Jim mentioned already coming up here along the left hand side and back up towards uh, structure 10. You can see the cycleway will actually go down on the, the local L2998 road also uh, as part of that kind of uh, interaction with the NTA to deliver that and provide a link. So this video this video now is uh, on the N25 uh, westbound, so we pass over structure one here, and link C is here under the southern span. Uh, structure two then will come up across that, which will allow link L to travel over link C. You can see here we have a number of piling rigs operating at the moment, uh, installing seams. Yeah, so that structure one is said a tree span bridge over the existing N25. So link C then will carry traffic from the N25 down to the tunnel. Structure 2 then will take traffic from Little Island and to the N8 towards the city. Uh, there's a number of piling rigs uh, working at the moment just south of the N25 installing CMCs and vertical drains. They're still aiming to link C there. We're coming up then to Structure 3 and Structure 4, just beyond where the PVD works is going on. Uh, we diverted a 900 mil uh, waterman, which I'll touch on in a few minutes. Uh, through this area here, and you'll see the case on here is uh, currently backfilled. We'll be talking about that. We have two new intertidal ponds to be excavated here, either side of Link C. Link K then will come in here and take traffic under Structure 5 uh, into the Jack Lynch Tunnel. So as we come across here, then we have Link C on our left hand side, and we have uh, Culvert 1, which is an 1800 mil diameter culvert installed there in the existing intertidal area which will be extended. Then we come on at the finish to structure five, which will take the traffic from the M8 into the tunnel and uh, northbound out of the tunnel as well as on. So the construction risks there. So the consultation with key stakeholders was a critical item at the outset. So a number of them are such as Cork City and County Council and Garda Chicana and the emergency services, residents and schools, local businesses, Uh, the OPW, Erin uh, Road Erin, uh, Jack Lynch Tunnel Operators, the motorway maintenance contractors, and in service providers such as Irish Water, DSB, and GNI Gas Networks Ireland. Uh, the Advanced Work Services. Uh, of services, so the upgrade of the existing 900 mil concrete waterman serving Little Island to a 900 mil diameter steel waterman as a clash with structure four. The diversion of a 600 mil diameter waterman also serving Little Island, which clashed with structure nine. And the installation of a pile protection slab over a 600 mil diameter gas transmission main as it was located under link J, along with a number of uh, ESP overhead and undergoing service diversions, along with a number of aircom and BT and smart diversions as well were all undertaken. Yeah, so this is uh, the case and I mentioned there during the video. So this water main diversion was required as the existing water main clashed with the proposed position of structure four. So the case on, as you see here in the aerial photo, is located at the, the northwest corner of structure four. So it was necessary to divert the, the water main uh, down vertically 90 degrees in under the pile cap and then bring up uh, structural columns for the structure, which will actually be formed around the, the water main in the permanent works. This is a ground level photo here then of the the water main as it was treaded through the, into the case and so that picture there relates to this area here when the water main was installed. So that was uh, excellent work to have out of the way in advance of the scheme. Uh, similarly, this is the installation of the gas main protection slab under link J. So we installed CFA piles and that was followed up then with a concrete 
uh, capping beam and uh, protection slabs over the existing gas main. Uh, further advanced works uh, didn't that were carried out included site invest investigation works. Uh, Jim, I wonder if you would control and if you work the slides because there's a delay and it's um, upsetting things, I think. So the link T roundabout on the L2998, the link Q roundabout was completed, and the link T1 slash U link row between the N8 eastbound and the M8 northbound, uh, which we opened up in January 2022. Uh, couple of months time, along with the combined pedestrian cyclist facilities and the uh, structure 16 pedestrian bridge of the railway. So you can see there at the top uh, left hand side, you have the link U and T1 diverge from the N8 and the cycle facilities. The photo on the top right hand side then is uh, further down that road where link U diverges alongside the railway bridge. And then down at the bottom right hand corner, we have the, the link T roundabout. Uh, alongside that then is the, the pedestrian bridge over the railway and the link queue roundabout then was the last area then. So where the works are located is within the intertidal area, all the works out of the Cork to Middleton ra railway line. So it's an EIS requirement to maintain the status quo in terms of the existing water levels. And there's an existing network of uh, pipe culverts connecting the intertidal areas, many of which have to be extended as part of the works. So as you can see in the sketch there, the blue areas are existing intertidal areas that remain. The red areas are intertidal areas that will be replaced. And the orange areas are the replacement intertidal areas. They're all interconnected with cul culverts and are impacted by the tide continually throughout the works. And to the artworks then. So overall on the site, there's a deficit of around 450,000 meters cubed. So which requires that material to be imported. Fortunately, we've been able to import a lot of general film material uh, under EPA Article 27 licenses, which has a hugely positive impact on the, the carbon footprint of the scheme. And insofar as practicable, any surplus and suitable material will be disposed of on site. Uh, due to the location of the site in the intertidal area, it's necessary to undertake uh, ground approval measures for the majority of the embankments, such as uh, excavate and replace, surcharge and hold, uh, prefabricated vertical drains and surcharge, and control modulus columns. And yeah, that's the ground improvement map there now for the overall site. So you'll see the blue areas are the excavate and replace areas. The green areas are the PVD areas. The salmon colored areas then are the CMC areas. And down at the, the bottom uh, right hand corner where you see the salmon and the yellow there, the CMC areas accompanied with steep and side slopes and the brown areas then are just surcharge and hold. So it's a fairly complex uh, ground improvement plan for the site. Yeah, just run through PVDs then. So at the top right hand side there, you can see the PVD rig, and that's accompanied but typically on site by a pre augering rig in order to penetrate through the made ground. Uh, typically, the PVDs are being installed at a 1.3 meter spacing grid. Uh, you can see at the bottom then a typical cross section showing the PVDs uh, penetrating through the, the made ground and the alluvium and a minimum 100 mil into the gravels below. Um, as you can see there, the embankment is constructed in, uh, and in this particular one doesn't interface with an intertidal pond and there's a sort charge to be placed. All the construction sequence then is prescribed in terms of the heights of the lifts and the releases of the separate hall periods, typically, which is uh, based on a certain required percentage dissipation of the excess pour water pressure. Uh, in relation to the CMCs then, so we have the CMC rig there on the top right hand corner with concrete and concrete is pumped in through the hollow stem of the auger and um, there's CMC works ongoing there south of the N25, there's two rigs there at the moment, you can see the typical cross section there as well. Um, with the PVD, that area has PVDs and PVDs and CMCs being installed and the CMCs have to penetrate into the gravels by a, a half meter minimum. So again, you can see the photo on the ground there of the, uh, the concrete being pumped through the hollow stem displacement auger. Uh, another uh, technique on the site is the 
construction of reinforced soil slopes. So we have typical cross section there where, as I said, uh, the typical side slopes are combined with CMCs. So you have the CMCs in a low distribution mat on top of that. And then the 6i6j and basal reinforcement is placed uh, along with geogrids and a facing material at the front face of it to encourage vegetation and to, to retain the material. Um, the advantage of the CMCs is, uh, or the reinforced side slopes is it reduces the footprint of the, of the earthworks. And it's also an alternative to conventionally retaining walls where the space is appropriate. The plan drawing extract uh, in the slide is at the, the northern side of the existing N25 at the Dunkettle Interchange Roundabout. And you can see at both the eastern and western side, this option has been taken up in order to reduce the footprint of the works, which allows more works to be done offline. Whereas in the center of the roundabout, a standard one is the two slope has been utilized. Just monitoring of the settlement in numerous standard techniques are being utilized, such as piezometers, inclinometers, magnetic extensometers, hydrostatic profile gauges, settlement monitoring plates, and as I said already, look, uh, specific criteria developed at each distinct location in order to establish the basis of the whole periods, etc., in the construction sequence. Next yeah, so I looked at just typical details there. So you've got the magnetic extensometer, the left hand side, and the inclinometer in the middle, then, and the piezometer. You can see the typical layout there in the plan extract at the bottom between that's between structure three and four, and the uh, just the details of the, the equipment and again, uh, prescribe the construction sequence that it has to be already in tandem with. Yeah, so I'll just move on to structures there now. So that's the first structure we'll have a quick look at is structure one. So it's a tree span bridge of the N25. Black box. Sorry about it, I'm just trying to resolve an issue on the uh, screen share there. So just hopefully this will resolve it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so as you can see there, the aerial photo at the top uh, left hand side, you can see the coffer dam in the existing N25 central median. Then you can see the ground uh, photo there just below that. So look, I suppose it's standard construction uh, details typically for the structures. What's different here is just uh, how curtailed the, the work sites are. So you can see there the, the coffer dam with the, the blinding being poured around the CFA piles and traffic at both sides. Um, you can also see there the, the BIM model being utilized by the contractor to uh, I suppose to detail the, all the intricate interfaces between the link rods and the structures, and that's working out quite well. Uh, at the bottom photo, then we recently installed the beams around two weeks ago on the central span, and uh, the northern span is due to be installed next week, with the southern span due to be installed before Christmas, as things stand. Yeah, so the next structure then is structure five. Uh, that'll take the traffic from the N25 uh, westbound to the M8 northbound. Um, and the traffic then from the M8 to the N40 will go under it as well. So in relation to that structure then, so you can see in the BIM model uh, and the piling there in the aerial photograph, that's for the eastern abutment of the structure, as you can see it there. Uh, most of the piling works was able to be constructed offline, and then there was uh, three or four piles that were on in the existing hard shoulder. We were able to utilize a, a scheduled tunnel closure to complete those works. So. 
Yeah, uh, the next two structures then are together, uh, structure six and seven. Structure six is the widening of the existing structure at the north side of the N25 westbound, and structure seven is a new standalone structure at the same location. Uh, some of the challenges with this is just, again, the tight workspace and retaining the existing N25. Uh, soil nailing was used in that regard for the temporary works. Uh, you can see the soil nailing or the shock creating being completed for retaining wall five. Uh, just alongside the works area. Uh, that allowed the CFA piling to be completed. Again, the tightness of the works area is a, a main uh, difficulty with completing the works. It led to the steel reinforcement have to be uh, lifted into place by uh, Cray and there just as there wasn't sufficient room to use an excavator or anything like that. So we go on there now to structure eight and nine, which are two rail structures. Structure eight is a tree spread bridge carrying the M8 over the railway line down towards the tunnel and structure nine carries the diverge from the N for the from the M8 southbound to the N25 eastbound. Again, uh, the temporary works is a key aspect to that. As you can see at the top right hand corner at the southern side of the railway track, we were able to get piling pretty much immediately as it was offline. Whereas at the northern side it was necessary to install a sheet pile wall in order to retain the existing M8. Uh, the beams were installed there in around May. The tree spans of the bridge are actually in place now. Um, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, the pouring of the decks were undertaken under nighttime rail closures. And uh, the deck is completed now and we actually intend to complete a major traffic switch on, of traffic on the M8 over that structure between just in ahead of Christmas. Uh, structure nine then. Uh, so that's a fairly standard structure as well with a reinforced soil wall. Uh, the, the beams you can see being delivered there at the end of April, there were the first beams to be placed on the site. Again, then the, the deck was poured under a nighttime rail position. Uh, you can see there from the bottom right hand side, the aerial photography of the waterproofing in place and the, the sand uh, asphalt carpet is in place now. So this uh, link will be brought into place and brought into um, use in 2022. Structure 10 then, that's an existing structure that has to be widened on the M8 southbound in order to provide sight lines for Link E. Um, the hydro demolition works uh, over the live road was a key aspect in order to open up that uh, works area. Uh, the whole works area was encapsulated and this allowed the work to be carried out over live traffic without any issue. Uh, that the, Abutment walls were then progressed and the beams have been installed on that structure as of last Friday night, there's one last beam to be installed. That's progressing quite well. Uh, structure 11 then, that is at just at the northern side of the Jack Lynch tunnel and it's uh, basically the entrance of the tunnel needs to be widened in order to take account of the link rods which are to join. So you can see the, the aerial photo is looking north. So those walls that uh, go up along there at the diverge point for Little Island, they need to be widened out in order to allow the, the link rods to come in from the N25 um, westbound along with the down southbound from the M8 and northbound as well. So that's the main uh, reason for that structure. Uh, traffic management phasing then, just in general. Uh, so our intent is to complete offline works initially. And then you know, we um, start carrying out online works being progressed with lane restrictions as required. And we're continually challenging ourselves in relation to achieving the optimum delivery of the scheme. And, you know, we're currently, as I mentioned, they are considering a TM switch for the M8 and the LinkedIn interface, which we believe will be very um, advantageous for the scheme in the long term. Uh, at all times, we will continue to keep motorists informed well of in advance of any upcoming changes. So apologies for, there was some, um, technical issues there, but that's the end of our... Yeah, so that's, a, that, that's our pre prepared friends. element, and we'll hand back to Ronan. Thanks very much, gents. Uh, very informative. Um, even as somebody who worked on the project, I learned a few bits. Um, so look, folks, um, why there's a few people have put in questions already, so you can use the Q&A functionality at the bottom. Of the, there's a button at the bottom of the screen there. Um, where you can submit questions. Um, Pat and Jim, you, you can actually see them as well as, as panelists. Um, so um, I suppose in in no particular order, um, 
I suppose one there is the first one I see. Uh, how how will tunnel closures be managed? Anyway, I'll let you take that one, Pat. Right. Yeah, no, I am typically the tunnel closures are managed by Yurto and they have a scheduled maintenance tunnel closures and project closures. So typically they're in fairness and they're able to issue a schedule of the upcoming uh, closures for a three month period. So it actually turns out to be very advantageous because typically we schedule work to dovetail with that. And Jim mentioned previously about the ITS works, advanced works that were undertaken, and they have taken advantage of that as well. So a lot of those items come up. Uh, we hold a monthly traffic management forum and all that information is shared. And what it does, we find is instead of uh, conflicts arising, it opens up the door for opportunities for contractors to kind of work uh, together and take opportunities of the tunnel closure like that opens up big works areas for everyone at the one time. So and I, I might just add to that one, I suppose. We, I'm not sure if that question was aimed at how closures are managed at the moment or how they will be afterwards. I suppose just to expand on Pat's response there that after the project, there will be um, the uh, the the, close, the the process of closing the tunnel will change um, due to the, the the different layout, obviously, and that's where a lot of the intelligent transport systems equipment will come into place. There will be a follow-on contract to and overlapping to add um, variable message signs, CCTV cameras, and all the rest of it, and a series of raising and lowering barriers. And uh, the tunnel maintenance contractor is working with us to develop um, traffic management and tunnel closure plans to go with all of that. Um, and it will be, a, I suppose, a more complex operation, but with a higher spec of equipment to a system. Yeah, very good. Um, you, sorry, John Martin, had a query there just about the um, the role of the TII on the project, you had mentioned that they were the, the, the client, which is somewhat unusual. Um, could you expand on that, Jim? Yeah, I suppose um, I, can't, I can't speak for TII on this one. And uh, that decision goes back to, to 2010. I suppose, look, I would say that the, um, the significance of the stakeholders um, at Little Island, um, just how close we are to uh, a number of 24-7 pharmaceuticals there. Um, the interface with Jack Lynch Tunnel is, um, I suppose it's, it's a massive responsibility and undertaking to handle that. And that is uh, managed directly by Transport Infrastructure Ireland themselves through their um, tunnel maintenance contractor. Um, so I suppose all of those factors would have played into it. Um, as well as I suppose the, 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 the sheer complexity of it and moving to um, moving to a managed a managed motorway environment um, similar to the Red Cow and the M50. Okay, very good. Um, so next question there, Ian McCarthy. Um, thanks for the presentation. Was there any option to have a free flow route when traveling from the M8 southbound and heading into the city via the N N8? Yeah, I knew I shouldn't have included that one. Um, <laughs> to, to have a free flow route there would have involved a, a third level um, when it comes to the flyovers and the underpasses, um, which I suppose is a, is, is a step too far um, on um, many, on I, many I, levels. I, I, I seem to remember as well that the i suppose the 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 percentage of traffic that actually takes that maneuver is actually significantly less than other routes um i seem to remember we, we had drawn footage was from april 2018 where you could actually see that quadrant of the the, the roundabout where traffic had come down the the m8 and was swinging around to the right you actually had gaps in the um uh, you know, coming up to the traffic lights, whereas other other parts of the roundabout, you had long tailbacks. Um, just you know, kind of a, a a visual indication of of the fact that maybe the, not as many vehicles make that maneuver as you might you might otherwise expect. Yeah, um, I suppose it's um, that's there's very detailed traffic modelling uh, would have been carried out back um, 
during the preliminary design stage and it was just something to um um yeah it was just in terms of the layout of the junction i suppose it you, you can't on you can't um overestimate how much of an influence little island has on the interchange you know um like in the context of the volumes making each movement um through the interchange the movements in and out of little island would be far more significant to the operation of the junction than the movements um you know to and from the m8 uh to, towards the city um but i suppose the, sh the short version is that um it would have meant another level to bring an overpass from the m8 across the junction and uh westward okay um so i suppose moving on because we have quite a few questions um i suppose just a, a query there about the kind of the makeup of the uh the proposed cycleway and i suppose is there is there kind of uh, noise barriers or that between it and the the uh the actual interchange itself um typically not yeah um, typically not typically there isn't there is a noise barrier um just out of structure 10 but other than, than that there isn't a noise barrier between the cyclists and yeah uh, yeah um, so the, the, na the nature of them running um will say one of the significant ones being coming north south uh from the glanmire Duncattle road onto the little island regional road the nature of them is that they're um you're on embankment yeah. you're you're on embankment you're on a structure uh you know you're on a widened very much a widened footpad on the structure to accommodate a cycle road uh so you are you're up off the tarmac on the other side of the curb but you're not physically segregated uh for the majority of that route then on the on the if i might just share briefly there again um Sorry, it's not quite cooperating me for me, but the, the route that is already open um, from the city up towards Glanmire, which is offline, um, there is more of a physical distance um, on that one, all right. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, a few people have asked uh, the likely value of the works. Um, is that in the public realm? We'll, uh, we'll say it's not, not in the scope of this presentation, Ron. Oh, yeah. <laughs> diplomatic Fair answer. Enough. Fair enough. Um, so um, somebody is wondering there about, um, I suppose, the in terms of the construction, the, the kind of carbon footprint of the, the project, if there's any been any kind of mitigation measures um, from that point, I know. TI have kind of carbon calculator tools and that for, for their projects? I suppose probably the biggest thing, we, as we mentioned there, was the availing of the Article 27 general film material. Typically, we've been able to get that from sites within probably an average of eight kilometers of the site, whereas if that was to be got from quarries, that's probably up to 12 to 15 kilometers away. So that's probably the most significant um, kind of positive we've been able to gauge site-wide, let's say, but we are um, continually looking out for opportunities in that regard, let's say, in terms of um, drainage, let's say, reusing existing and whatnot, so just to minimise the carbon footprint of the scheme. I suppose it's, it's a, it, it raises an interesting point on how you measure the impact of these things, because you can look at that as the um, quarry runs to the Duncattle project saved, but then we're also providing um, a productive home under the circular economy heading, I suppose, for uh, construction, demolition and other materials yeah. in the city and surrounding sites. So I suppose we, well, it, it is having an impact um, beyond our project yeah. um, on that level. Um, somebody, uh, not sure if it's already mentioned, but what's the expected completion date for all the works? It was 2024, was it? Yeah, I suppose I, I, I'm actually, I am actually glad that somebody asked that because I don't think I mentioned it. A very important point I had up the 29th of March, 2024. But of course, um, the again, I suppose one of the aspects that makes this scheme different from, you know, our usual typical linear national road scheme is that there isn't going to be one big ribbon cutting 
opening at the end, um, we will make links available to the motorists, to the public as soon as absolutely possible. Um, so, you know, we'd expect that to kick off early next year with the N8 to M8 link. And then I suppose the most significant one will be the route southbound from the M8 um, over uh, structure one, as we call it, the new structure over the N25 linking onto the regional road in Little Island. Um, so the motorists will feel the benefit or at different times, depending on what their particular route is. Okay. Um, someone's asking there, can you explain the interconnection between Jacobs and the design construction team? Um, I suppose I suppose they're asking what the role of the of, of the ER is. Yeah, okay. I suppose in terms of ourselves, I suppose myself and Pat and uh, our colleagues here on site are um, the resident engineer team, um, which uh, includes employees of Cork County Council and Jacobs working as one integrated team. And um, those of us uh, who are Cork County Council employees are seconded to Jacobs for the duration of the project. Um, I suppose um, perhaps an, ob uh, an obvious question, um, uh, what has the, the effects of COVID been on the project? Yeah, well, I suppose uh, it's a lot of effects in terms of actually completing works, let's say, and say, getting implementing best practice, I suppose, how people get to work, uh, washing facilities uh, within the offices, offices let's say. Uh, we have a uh, kind of separation area separated out for individual workspaces for people and um, it does have an impact on productivity and um, but hopefully look things are starting to hopefully look up in that regard like so with vaccination we've been very fortunate um, we've had I think um, one case on site uh, in total throughout COVID so I think that's testament to the, the measures that have been uh, put in place yeah. on site by CISC. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely what needs to be said. Yeah. Being being a bit flippant, and, um, I, I, I guess it's... Um, I suppose it's sorry, just worth mentioning as well that... Hey, Ronan. Sorry, I, I, my connection, I say, is a bit wonky. Go on, Jim. I, sorry, I, I, I was going to say, just should note as well, that the project was classified as a critical infrastructure project. So... Mm we were permitted to um, uh, keep going through that period in January, February of 2021, um, which, you know, given the reduced traffic volumes on the road was, um, it would have been a missed opportunity if that wasn't possible. So thankfully we were permitted to go ahead. And uh, as Pat said, the way that CISC have managed it, I think is more than justified that decision. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to kind of make that point. That it, it's actually a pity that that the reduced traffic volumes aren't, aren't continuing. Um, <laughs> would make life a lot easier. But however, I have to deal with what we what we have. Um, um, I suppose kind of a couple of similar questions, just in terms, uh, which I suppose is somewhat outside the scope of the project. But you know, once done, kettle is. Um, finished, will there be expected knock-on effects on other junctions? And are you aware of, you know, is, is, is there further work being done on that? Yeah, I suppose the, to talk about the road side of it, first of all, um, their uh, TII have um, a couple of projects at various stages of, of appraisal um, on the N25, um, Around, I suppose what we would call the, the, the Middleton bypass area that's been, being looked at incorporating uh, Cove Cross and so on. And similarly, um, uh, an appraisal has been carried out on, um, on the N40 um, with consultants to be appointed to look at, uh, to look at options on the N40. Um, I suppose that is the most constrained route heading to and from Dunkettle. Um, the tunnel, obviously, the capacity of the tunnel is what it is, um, and that's factored into the design of the interchange itself. But I suppose the other side of it is, um, as I mentioned, that we're delivering this in the context of CMATs, and um, 
I suppose one big thing that maybe I skipped over a bit earlier is that uh, Dunkettle is genuinely a major enabler of public transport and commuting beyond the individual private car. Um, in that, the Ronan, as you know, we would have met people who are from discussions with various stakeholders, buses just don't run through the tunnel at the moment and buses uh, haven't ran through Little Island for a long time because they just haven't been able to keep a timetable. So, I mean, we're specifically incorporating a bus lane in one aspect and just by um, minimizing the congestion and removing the lengthy queues, buses can take timetables and we can anticipate bus routes using the interchange and using the tunnel more so. Um, and then following on from that, if the CMATS plans for rail transport come true, you know, we could have that um, park and ride and so on. So the, 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 I suppose, look, the answer to these things everyone accepts at this point is uh, more holistic. That is not just more capacity and more roads. And that's very much um, a factor in the design process, I suppose. Yeah, you're on. Oh, apologies. Yeah, uh, there, we have a couple of questions there. I'm going to kind of maybe maybe merge them in together, but I suppose just queries. Um, maybe one for Pat just on, on on ground conditions and the the, the various challenges. Um, I don't know if you could just maybe expand a little bit. Um, um, yeah, no, look, as we've been through there in the presentation, like there's a, a lot of different uh, ground improvement measures uh, required. Um, overall, I think the ground conditions are very much in line with what was expected. You know, there was a fairly extensive site investigation carried out in advance of the contract. Uh, there was further supplementary site investigation carried out since the contract uh, has been awarded. And um, uh, the ground improvement plan we saw there, that's very much in line with what was on the table at specimen design stage as well. So probably a big positive on site is most of the, the most of the material we're encountering is suitable to be reused. Granted, it, it's subject to suitable weather conditions. So look, that is a positive. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to handle and ideally dis, to dispose of it within the, within the permanent embankments and also makes it much easier to dispose of it on site in the offline landscape areas as well. Like today, there's been uh, no material disposed of off site as of yet. And look, the intent is uh, for that uh, last throw the project, look, but that will be a challenge and there'll be a couple of factors such as weather, et cetera, will impact on that. Okay. Um, to some similar questions, but I suppose on, on completion, is there any kind of idea of either the expected kind of capacity of, of the junction and or uh, an idea of what effect it'll have on journey times? Um, <laughs> yeah. um, possibly I should know the answer to that, but I think I'll have to pass on that one, Ronan. Um, I, think, uh, I think I think a couple of years ago, I probably would have known the answer to that, but uh, the head has been too close to the project itself at this point. And, I'd have to come back with it and answer on that. Yeah. Um, I'll just know it's just it's some. There's a lot of questions that are kind of similar, so I'm just trying to 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 bring them um, together. Um, I suppose um, there's one question there, which I suppose is kind of being superseded. But somebody was asking about who assists design partners for this design and build contract, but I suppose it's not technically design and build anymore is it? Oh, it is. Uh, is so look, CISC's designers are a kind of a joint venture between Feli Timoney, uh, Clan and Dylan Civil Consulting and Rambo, a UK designer. So yeah. uh, Feli Timoney are typically doing the structures. Um, Rambo will be doing the geotechnical and Clan, Clan Dylan Civil Consult will be doing a lot of the drainage safety barrier and pavement design and things like that. So I look, I think they've, the three sets of designers work quite well together. So there's a comp, as you could see, maybe from some of the BIM models and just the overall layout, it's fairly complex um, scheme. So there's a lot of coordination required between the three. And a, 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 a linked, linked and ongoing uh, liaison on uh, geotechnics, as you can imagine, based on what you've seen from Pat there with Absolutely. Jacob's um, 
Um, somebody was just asking there about about the the the, the presentation. So we are recording this evening's uh, presentation, and the intention is to to put it up on the Engineers Ireland YouTube channel, so it, it'll 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 be available. Um, um, just um, some note there, just so out of curiosity, how large is the workforce on 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 the the site? You know, approximately, or kind of. So there's on two hundred on site at the moment. Mm. Let's say okay. kind of consistently. Okay, that's that's quite a lot for you know what is a relatively yeah. compact site. Um, yeah, look, there's a, a number of structures on go, and then you the CMC rigs. Let's say you could have two CMC, you could have two CMC rigs, two probing rigs, and two PVD rigs working in tandem. Uh, yeah. you, know, you could have CFA piling rigs, and then there's separate PVD. Uh, pair rigs in for the PVD only area. So when you start adding up all those, um, yeah. along yeah. with the structures, workforce, and the civils for drainage, etc., it yeah. doesn't belong adding up. It's quite a lot. Yeah, um, McCroom is around 300, I think, but a, 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 a longer site. Uh, yeah. It's more spread out. Um, um, so, um, I know, I'm just. Um, uh, presumably there was a specialist traffic management company used by six and temporary traffic management is one of the biggest challenges any issues or concerns with temporary traffic management setup um, and driver behavior so far i suppose there's a chmr six uh, specialist traffic management uh, uh, subcontractor um no the uh, each of the traffic management designs are a company with a road safety audit where reasonably happy with the traffic management way it's set up and being implemented, uh, driver behaviour. Um, anyone commuting through the area will know there's a 60 kilometre an hour speed limit in place and adherence to that it wouldn't be extremely high. It's probably one way of describing it. So I look, that is a concern at times um, just for the welfare and safety of uh, operatives on site, but it's something that we're uh, monitoring and Cisco monitoring. Yeah. And I suppose it would have to be acknowledged, I suppose, that look, the reduced traffic volumes um, have had an impact and as volumes ramp up and um, hopefully with no more lockdowns, um, driver behavior is something that we are very conscious of. I suppose that we, the CISC and uh, all the other subcontractors put a lot of work into accommodating the motorists and I suppose it goes both ways that we've there's a lot of focus on protecting the workforce as well, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, very good. Um, no, uh, I think we've kind of answered a lot of them, you know, in terms of, of kind of repeat questions and that. Um, we do have two questions, and I, I to be honest, you feel free now to. To, to 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 skip on these, but I suppose we've asked about kind of the the contract administration um, and and the form of contract that's being used um, currently on the projects. Yes, the, the PwC design and build. Um, would I be putting you on the spot to 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 volunteer an opinion on the change from any seats back to PwC? Would you have liked to have seen? It go forward on NEC from the, the 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 original. Well, I suppose the 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 NEC part of it. I suppose just to give people a bit of background, um, that uh, an NEC contract was awarded, um, and um, was awarded to John Siskin's son also, uh, but I suppose um, I think. The decision to make that a two-stage process was definitely validated. So, advanced works and uh, detailed design were carried out by by Cisc and their designers under the stage one, um, and that detailed design was carried forward and contributed to the the project that's being constructed out there as we speak. Um, and the stage one also included a process to arrive at a target cost. Uh, so the two parties didn't agree on that cost. And um, so stage two was not completed as uh, an NEC contract. Uh, it was completed, or it is being completed as a design and build contract. Um, but the tender period um, 
uh, the, some of those very significant service diversions and so on that Pat described earlier were completed during the tender period for the design and build. So um, there was a break bil uh, built in uh, between stage one and stage two, and the decision was made not to go to stage two. Um, so yeah, oh, I suppose I would just comment on that stage one was quite successful uh, in enabling and de-risking um what we're doing now um and i suppose that's as far as i could comment on that yeah that's fair enough, that's fair enough. um so look it's kind of it's, it's 10 past eight there so um i might just one one last question and um i'll, I'll bring the, the the evening to a close then um and look apologies if i haven't got to everybody's questions i was trying to to to, to start through them and, and merge them together as well as possible so and last question i suppose primarily aimed at Pat. Um, were there any concerns in using the, the CMCs on, on this project and have there been have they been used on other schemes in Ireland um, that you're aware of? Yeah um I suppose look there the, we got through the detailed design process so that's kind of reassures us in terms of the use of them. Um, you know, they're going through the made ground, through the alluvium and uh, into the gravels below. Uh, the quality of the workmanship being carried out is to a very high standard by Vibro Menard on behalf of CISC. Um, have the CMCs been used elsewhere in the country? They have been used. They've been used on the Bend and Sarsfields roundabout scheme there back in 2012, let's say. And they've been used um, very widespread across Europe, let's say, in uh, the UK and uh, Vibro Menard are a French company themselves. Like so. I suppose they have been new. They've come probably a long way since 2012, and they're probably more so an emergent thing. Uh, they have a lot more um, projects completed now successfully, so we're um, very confident. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, so, look, folks, um, I'm going to bring the evening to a close. So, um, you know, I'd like to, to thank Jim and Pat for excellent presentation. Very interesting. Um, a couple of technical glitches, but yeah. for a room full of engineers, um, we can solve those. I didn't um, think I, I didn't think anyone noticed, Ron. <laughs> Black box. But, um, <laughs> but no, no, no. Seriously, very, very, very interesting. Um, uh, Jim, I have him on record as saying that they will be back again, and I will have you back. Um, Definitely. Um, in, in, there's, 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 you know, um, at least three more lectures, I think, out of it. Um, one, one <laughs> per year. Um, so look, guys, uh, thanks very much. Um, very much appreciated. Very large attendance at it, which kind of, I think, you know, gives um, an idea of the interest in the actual project. But then I think the the the, the large volume of questions in the Q and A then gives. Um, you know, uh, an idea of, of the interest in the actual presentation as as, as it was given. Um, you know, traditionally at this point, if we were in, in, in traditionally we'd be in room and we'd be giving a round of applause at this point. But you know, on behalf of myself and the committee, the members and the attendees, uh, I'd like to to thank.